everyone. This is Lynn Crawford from Hope Dementia Support, and I have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Angela Hansen to you from the University of Washington. And uh, she's been up to some things since we saw her last, so I'm going to let her tell you a little bit more about herself and what she does. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. And uh, sorry if there was confusion about the topic and everything. Um, so I'm a geriatrician and I work at the Memory and Brain Wellness Center at Harborview. So geriatrician or geriatrics. So I specialize in caring for older adults. And one of the topics near and dear to my heart as a geriatrician or a geriatric provider is medications. So are older people on the right medications? Are they on too many medications? Do they know what their medications are? And are they are their medications interacting or causing side effects? So that's a really common topic that gets us all excited as uh, geriatric doctors. Um, and you know, of course, if someone has memory loss or dementia, um, that topic is also very important. So um, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, big broad to, uh, topic um, in the context of memory loss. So that's kind of the overview. I guess other things that I'm up to are, I was sharing earlier, I have my dream job, which is apparently right now keeping me pretty busy. Um, in addition to working at the memory clinic and doing a little bit of geriatrics work, I do research work in dementia. So I actually study a couple of drugs or medications um, for dementia. We do clinical trials. Um, we we study repurposed um, diabetes drugs, so metformin and semaglutide, to see if those help uh, memory loss. And so when we're studying medications, uh, there's a lot that goes into that too. So I'm always thinking about medications. Uh, are people on the right ones, right doses? So this topic is near and dear to my heart. So thanks for allowing me to give that intro. So I guess I'll go ahead and start the talk. Um, okay. So let's see. All right. So of course I have to give a typical disclaimer. Um, <laughs> I listen, I listen to a law podcast when I'm, you know, driving back and forth to work and they always say, please don't take law advice from a podcast or whatever. So I have to give the, you know, please don't use this for individual medical advice. You know, things can really vary. If I say, hey, there's a medication that may or may not be, you know, good for dementia, there's always exceptions to the rule. So, you know, definitely consult with your doctor before starting or stopping any medications. Um, these are big, broad topics, and there's always exceptions to the rule. Um, okay. so. Um, I give this talk, or I give talks to um, medical students and people who are in training. And this is a slide I stole from that talk. And there's a lot of things that can contribute to memory loss or cognitive impairment. So there's diseases of medical diseases like diabetes. If your diabetes gets really out of whack, that can cause memory loss. Uh, neurologic diseases, of course, like Alzheimer's, if you have a stroke. Just psychosocial uh, or lack of supports if somebody's caregiver dies or goes on vacation, or if somebody moves to a new community and they're um, out of their routine. If they have depression or anxiety or poor sleep, that can contribute to memory loss. And then I have here medications. There Angela, are actually, oh yes. Me, can you share? Oh, are they, are my, my slides not shared again? Uh-uh. -uh. Oh gosh, I'm so sorry. No, that's okay. I thought they were still shared from the from the practice. Oh goodness. Uh thank you for pointing that Absolutely. out. Okay. Oh, I uh, thought back it was just an intro at first and then it occurred to me. Oh, that yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I and, and I hadn't really gone very far in the talk here. So okay, here's okay, here we go. So um here's my disclaimer. Please don't use the um what I say here for individual medical advice, please consult with your medical provider before stopping or starting any medication. Okay. Um, can you all see the slides now? 
Sorry about that. I, I had shared them earlier and I guess I had to share them again. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, what can cause memory loss? Lots of different things. Medical diseases, neurologic diseases, your support system, or if your support system can get out of whack, psychiatric conditions like depression or poor sleep. And then here I have medications. So there are medications that can actually cause memory loss. And we'll go through some of those today. So all of these things can contribute and they can interact with each other to cause memory loss or to make memory loss worse. So when I see people in my clinic, I will often try to go through a lot of these things and find maybe reversible causes and sometimes irreversible causes of cognitive impairment. Okay, I'm gonna go through a quick neurology lesson, but hopefully it'll be fun. <laughs> Uh, more fun than when I was in medical school. Although I kind of liked medical school, so it was fun then too. Um, but um, we we all have a bunch of nerves in our brain and they talk to each other by um, using neurotransmitters. And neurotransmitters, we can kind of think of as they pass notes to each other millions of times a second. And um, there's different neurotransmitters for different parts of the brain. And one is called choline aka acetylcholine, but I think choline is just easier to say. So choline is one of those messengers that our nerves use to talk to each other. And um, dopamine is another one you may have heard of. And the brain uses choline to send signals back and forth. Um, but the nerves in your lower body also use choline. And you'll see later on why that matters. Okay, here's a picture of two nerves talking to each other. So here's the postsynaptic terminal and then a presynaptic, which is fancy words, I know. Um, but basically two nerves talking to each other. And you'll see there's a space here. So there's a space, they don't actually touch each other. They have to uh, pass that note kind of like uh, in, in space. So um, this uh, nerve gets a signal from a nerve before it, and now it's gonna send a signal to the nerve in front of it. and Here's the choline and acetyl CoA. It packages it up and releases it into this cleft. And then the acetyl choline binds to the next nerve. And when that binding happens, that's when the signal is, um, is sent. So it's this very fancy system that happens, like I said, a million times a second all throughout our brain. So this is acetyl choline. You'll see this um, triangle here. I should have made it a little Pac-Man, like chewing everything up. Um, this is acetylcholinesterase. Wow, what a mouthful, I know. Um, acetylcholinesterase, or um, the Pac-Man, this will chew up the acetylcholine. Because you can imagine you don't want that signal going on and on and on. Otherwise, you'd never turn off your thoughts. You know, you'd have that, I have to go to the bathroom, and you'd still have that thought after you went. Um, you need to shut off the signal. So um, this is the way that our brain shuts off the signal. So you send the signal and then this chews up the signal and then they get re reabsorbed. So you will see later. Okay, so acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Ugh. I like to call them choline boosters because that's way easier to say. Those inhibit this Pac-Man guy, this red arrow so that the signal lasts longer. Because in Alzheimer's disease, there's a, um, a breakdown of this whole system. The choline nerves are struggling. So if you leave choline around longer, that helps these nerves work better. So things like donepezil or Aricept or galantamine, um, those drugs actually inhibit the breakdown of the messenger and that causes, um, this signal, you see there's three arrows now. Before there was just one, now there's three. You know, this is just for a picture um, showing you the signal is working better. Now, there are drugs called anticholinergics, and those actually block the signal. They're what we call a competitive inhibitor of acetylcholine. What they do, they come in, they look like acetylcholine, but they don't signal, they actually block the signal. They say, nope, and they block it, and they prevent the signal from going through. And examples of anticholinergics are like Benadryl, 
um, or diphenhydramine. So Benadryl, what we all take during allergy season, which in Seattle is like the entire year, if you're like me. <laughs> um, Detrol or some medicines for bladder. Amitriptyline is an old school antidepressant. Um, there's quite a few anticholinergics out there. Um, so you can see that Benadryl is a direct enemy of denepazil. They do opposite things to each other. So anticholinergics, multiple studies now show that these medications can cause cognitive impairment and their risk factors for dementia. And so the guidelines are to try to be not, try to stop as many anticholinergics as you can. And if you're not sure if you're on an anticholinergic, this is a really good thing to talk with your doctor about or talk with your doctor if your um, loved one is on one of these. A pharmacist can help too. Um, most of them, again, are like things like Benadryl or Doxepin, um, bladder medications, and then some antidepressants. Oh, I have a slide about that. <laughs> what drugs are anticholinergic? Um, this is not a, a, a full list, but oxybutynin or ditropan, detrol is another one, scopolamine patches for nausea, um, some old school antidepressants. Um, Paxil is also a little bit of anticholinergic. Benadryl is probably the biggest one that we like to harp on. The best way to know is to talk with your doctor about each medication. Now, if you take a Benadryl once in a while, it's okay, but what we really want to avoid is people being on them constantly. All right, now I'm going to talk about sedating medications. We think that medications that cause you to be sleepy or, you know, um, or uh, sedating, um, those can cause confusion and also increase your risk of falling. And people who have dementia or cognitive impairment are already at increased risk of falling anyway. So things like lorazepam or Ativan, so those anti-anxiety medicines, opioids, of course, gabapentin, uh, many other medications have sedating uh, side effects. Now, sometimes people really need some of these medications if they have a lot of chronic pain. Um, so if you are on them, you know, use low doses or, um, you know, make sure you're on the lowest dose or making sure you're not falling on them. It's not that you can't be on them. It's just to minimize them or making sure that you're not having confusion or falls. Or if you start them, start low and go slow. Um, so those are a few medications that we try to avoid or minimize if someone has memory loss or cognitive impairment. What drugs do we use for um, dementia? All right, so here's some general facts. So these are things that I like to tell my patients in clinic. So I kind of sound like a politician when I talk about these drugs a little bit, because I say, well, on the one hand, they're fairly safe. They don't really interact with a lot of drugs. They're pretty, you know, they can be effective. Um, and they, they're well tolerated for a lot of people. So there's a lot of reasons to try them. On the other hand, they really aren't a cure. And results in the real world will vary. Some people seem to benefit. Some people will start these medication, medications and go, Doc, I don't know if they're helping. They don't seem to do anything for me. So that's where I say I kind of sound like a politician. So I'm like, well, on the one hand, on the other hand. These are kind of gen general um, things that I, I tell patients. Um, the other thing is, I think decisions about these medications can be tough in the sense that it's sometimes hard to know if they're working or are they stabilizing something. It's not like a blood pressure pill where you can check your blood pressure and know right away, right? Let's say your doctor starts a medication for your blood pressure. And then over the next week or two, you can check your blood pressure and see if it's working. For memory medications, that's a little tougher, right? You know, you can do some memory tests and stuff, but it's not, it's not as easy to know, is this medication helping or not? So when I start these medications, I always want to make sure first we're doing no harm. Are you tolerating it okay? Are you affording it okay? And if you're tolerating it okay and you're doing okay that way, then we get into, is it helping? And do we want to continue it at each visit? All right. So here are the three kind of main classes. The acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, which I said earlier is a mouthful. So I allow people to call them the choline boosters. 
And the three examples are donepezil or Aricept, galantamine or Razodyne, or Rivastigmine or Exelon. You may have heard of these medications and you or people you know might be on them. There's another class of medicine called memantine or Namenda. And that's an NMDA receptor antagonist, which is, what is that? Um, it acts on another set of receptors. It's uh, also called a glutamate booster. So it acts on glutamate, which is another neurotransmitter. You know, it, it, uh, it doesn't affect choline. So you can use it in addition to the choline boosters. You can add it to Aricept. And a lot of people are on both. Namzaric is a combo pill. So I don't have a lot of patients on the combo pill. I think mostly because at Harborview, it's a little more expensive. Um, but the combo pill is donepezil and memantine together. So if people are having trouble with swallowing pills or taking a lot of pills at once, combo pills can be helpful um, so they don't have to swallow like six or seven pills or something. Um, but combo pills are tricky because if you have to adjust the dose, you know, a combo pill already has everything together. So you can't really separate it. So the choline boosters, like I said, donepezil, Aricept is an example. They're for mild, moderate, or severe Alzheimer's. They're also effective for Lewy body dementia, especially if people are having hallucinations. They can be used in other dementias, like people who have had strokes. Um, what the drug companies and the um, uh, kind of the drug, if you look up the insert, it says that donepezil delays the progressive worsening of cognitive symptoms of Alzheimer's. Um, side of, uh, you want to be careful if you've had a GI bleed or a stomach bleed, if you have a low heart rate or problems with falling. Side effects can include passing out or syncope. Um, pretty low, but if you have that problem already, this might be a medication to be uh, cautious with. So the GI side effects are the most common thing that I see. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, loss of appetite. We minimize this by starting at a lower dose and titrating it up but sometimes we still see these things. So diarrhea is the most common thing. A low heart rate again, because our heart uses choline too. When our heart sees choline, it slows down. Now, if our heart rate is already pretty normal, it's not a big deal. But if you're already on a beta blocker, or if you already have a low heart rate for some other reason, then this medication might not be a really good idea. Other side effects of these choline boosters can include vivid dreams. And most people are not bothered by that, but occasionally I'll hear about a patient having a nightmare. Cramping, dizziness, headache. Every now and then I hear about urinary incontinence. These are pretty rare. And usually only when we first start. The big side effects that I worry about are GI and the heart rate issue. If you don't have those two things, then usually you're doing okay. All right, memantine or Namenda. This is a complex drug that probably does several things. If you read the studies, it's kind of overwhelming, but it blocks this receptor that's in the neuron, which helps with glutamate toxicity. Who is it for? It's for moderate to severe Alzheimer's. It really hasn't been shown to help people with the more mild stages. Although I have said, I have seen, you know, people will come to my clinic and they're already on memantine. They got put on it by somebody else and they have MCI or mild cognitive impairment. You know, if somebody comes to my clinic and they have mild cognitive impairment and they were put on memantine, which isn't really indicated yet, what I'll do is I'll have a conversation. I'll say, hey, do you think it was helping? And if they thought it was helping them, I'll go ahead and leave it on. I won't wrestle it out. For them. Well, technically you're not supposed to be on that, you know. But if they say, you know, doctor, I don't think this is helping me at all and it might be causing some side effects, then we'll go, go ahead and stop it and restart it later when their disease is more advanced. Um, the benefits of memantine. One study showed that it improved illusions, hallucinations, agitation, aggression, and irritability. So it can sometimes help with behavior symptoms. Another study showed that it modestly improved attention global well-being, daily function, and independence. So it can help. Um, and if somebody is having these symptoms, um, it's certainly worth trying the medication. Okay, here's 
here's my problem with Mamantine or Namenda. The dosing is like, Nah. <laughs> well, it, I, I pull my hair out when I dose this because here's the dosing. Five milligrams for a week, then five milligrams twice a day for a week, then five milligrams in the morning, then 10 milligrams in the evening, then 10 milligrams. Clear as mud, right? And then what the pharmacy does is they'll give you five milligram tablets and then they'll switch you to tens, but you won't notice and you'll take two of them. And, ah. <laughs> so I when I write this medication, what I usually do is I do five milligrams for a week and then five milligrams twice a day for a week. And then I check in. I say, how's it going? And if it's going well, we could either stay there at the half dose or we can switch it then to the tens. And then I, at that point, say, okay, the pharmacy is going to change the pill on you now. Please don't take two tens. <laughs> so, um, but when I write this big complicated up taper, um, I worry about um, people um, accidentally mixing up the dosing. So it's just something to be aware of. Um, side effects of memantine, usually when we're doing that titration, which is why I've kind of changed my practice to instead of doing this big long thing, do half of it and then check in. Um, oops. Um, uh, side effects, nausea, vomiting. It's been reported to cause diarrhea or constipation. I don't hear about it as much. Dinepazil seems to cause a lot more diarrhea than the Manti. Here's the thing that I see the most, dizziness and lightheaded cognitive fog, especially at the high doses. So that's why I also changed my practice a little bit. Instead of getting people on that full, full dose, I get them on the half dose and check in. And there is a lower dose that you have to be on if you have kidney problems. Uh, the max dose of Namenda is um, 10 milligrams twice a day. So I'm going to go back to this. So if you're writing the full titration of memantine, the 10 milligrams twice a day is the full dose of memantine. Now, there is a long-acting version of it, and it doesn't quite translate. Um, I think. Uh, I would have to look that up. It's not quite 20 milligrams. So the long acting pill is not the exact same dose as it's not 20. I think it's like 16 or something. It's like an, a, a dose equivalent that a pharmacist would help you with. Um, but the, the max dose of the short acting memantine is 10 milligrams in the morning and 10 milligrams in the evening. So 20 milligrams total. I hope that was clear. This, this medicine is more complicated dose. The other thing that I worry about with memantine is if somebody is um, getting medications through like an adult family home or a pill dispenser or something and they have help once a day, this dose dosing is obviously twice a day. So it's trickier, you know. Oh, what kidney function is recommended at what stage? Um, I would just refer you to your pharmacist to look that up. I think it's stage... If you're stage three or four um, renal failure, you have to dose it down to, you can only get on half the dose. So like five milligrams twice a day is the highest dose you can be on. Um, but I, yeah, I, I don't have that totally memorized. <laughs> so I would definitely um, refer you to your pharmacist to, to um, dose it, but it's not super complex. It's basically just like one dose for, one group and one dose for other groups. Yeah. Um, um, okay. So um, let me see what I'm just going to do a little time check in here. Um, are there um, any specific questions about the oral pills for Alzheimer's before I talk about the uh, adjuvant, about the FDA approved what I call chemo agents. I'm going to talk briefly about those. Could you address the use of uh, denepazil and uh, Parkinson's disease? So when people yeah. have Parkinson's and dementia? Yeah, so the question about uh, Parkinson's and dementia. So good question. So um, the uh, denepazil, galantamine, and rivastigmine are all choline boosters. And in theory, they all do the same thing. Um, and they have been shown to help hallucinations 
in Lewy body dementia um, or Parkinson's disease dementia, um, I would say it, um, pretty similar as well. So if someone has Parkinson's disease dementia or Lewy body dementia and they have hallucinations, um, definitely would advocate starting one of these three medications. Now, um, do these medications help the cognitive symptoms for Parkinson's or for Lewy body? I think that's a little less clear, but we definitely do try them in those patients as well um, because they potentially have, well, they potentially could have some Alzheimer's changes for one. And then the second thing is there's just a lot of overlap with these neurotransmitters going awry in Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and Lewy body. So I think they're worth trying. Um, what I've seen, seen in my practice is that, yes, denethazil can help the memory symptoms for Parkinson's disease dementia and for Lewy body dementia, um, but they're less well studied for the cognitive piece. They're more studied for the hallucinations and then for the memory for Alzheimer's. I hope that kind of answered the question. Um, and, and then how about the Parkinson's medications related to the dementia? The Parkinson's medication. Okay, so if you're on like, like Cinemet. Yes. If yes. you're on, yes. So absolutely. So um, uh, it's a little bit of a, a, a balance. So Cinemet and all the dopamine medications. So if you have Parkinson's, symptoms so hard to move you your body your brain wants to move but your body doesn't cooperate um cinnamon and those medications can help they help get your body moving this the symptom that they help the most is that what we call bradykinesia in other words all right someone tell me to move like angela hansen stand up and then i stand up like an hour later you know um that Cinemet helps that the most. It helps tremor not as much, um, but the bradykinesia does respond to Cinemet. So first you kind of want to know what symptoms you're treating and make sure you're not just putting someone on Cinemet just to put them on Cinemet. So make sure you're, you know, you're working closely with a neurologist or somebody to, you know, right dose, right time for the, for the, for the um, movement disorder aspect. Cause Cinemet is complicated. That could be an hour long talk. <laughs> If anyone is on that, it's a it's a tricky medicine. Um, and then the other thing is Cinemet is dopamine boosting. And what dopamine does is it boosts everything in the brain for dopamine. And that can cause or worsen hallucinations. So if you have Lewy body or prone to Lewy body or hallucinations, that can make those worse. So do you put someone on Dinepazil or do you back off on the Cinemet or what do you do? So that can be tricky. And so I think that um, working with a neurologist to really titrate those medications or maybe take the Cinemet during the day, making, you know, maybe not at night, um, it can be tricky for sure. Um, I hope I hope that kind of answers the question, but you absolutely can be on both Cinemet and Dinepazil. Um, They don't interact with each other um, directly. Uh, I mean, they don't fight. I guess, <laughs> and they kind of um, they kind of complement each other. Actually, um, I think what we want to avoid in geriatrics is let's say you take a medication and then that causes a side effect, then you take another medication to treat that side effect, and then you take another medication to treat the side effect of the second medication. It's kind of like the house that Jack built. You know, this is the house that Jack built. This is the malt that uh, laid in the house that Jack. You know, you're just like piling on and on and on. Um, now, sometimes you have to do that, um, but what would be better is if you're taking Cinemet and that's causing hallucinations, maybe we can go down on the Cinemet a little bit. Done. You know, I know not, it's not always that straightforward, um, but but um, you just want to make sure you know, um, you know, right dose, right time um, for all your medications. So I don't know if that answered, <laughs> probably over answered a question, but hopefully no. that kind of explains. Absolutely answered. I know that that is often a concern with the uh, Parkinson's that uh, Lewy body follows. For so sure, already, yeah. And on the Cinemet and 
Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and if someone has Parkinson's, especially long standing Parkinson's, you know, I highly recommend again, that working with very carefully with your neuro neurologist. Oh, so Cinemet. So sin, let's see, Cinemet. I will put it in the chat. It's also called Levodopa Carbidopa is kind of the um, generic name. Um, so people may be familiar with Cinemet or Levodopa Carbidopa. Uh, Cinemet is a medication that people are on if they have Parkinson's or Parkinson's-like disorders. Again, um, your brain wants to move, but your body doesn't want to move. And that's the medication that um, that will help that. There are other reasons people might be on that, like restless leg and stuff like that. But in general, the main reason why people are on Cinemet is to help them get out of a chair. Well, let's talk about the exciting new drugs that no one's getting. <laughs> no one. <laughs> and that's um, the FDA approved meds over the last couple of years um, that are the IV medications for that treat the amyloid for Alzheimer's. So one of these is called aducanumab, aka Aduhil. I'm just going to go to the next slide. And the other one is called lecanumab, aka Lakimbi. So I don't know how many of you have heard of these medications, if you've asked your doctor about them, if you've read about them in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Post, the LA Times, like they've been everywhere, right? Um, they made lots of headlines. Um, the bottom line is that they're not really being given right now at this time because at, at most centers, because they're, they're kind of like chemotherapy for Alzheimer's and they're very expensive. Um, and they're not really covered by Medicare right now. So I'm going to go through those a little bit more clearly. So what aducanumab and lecanumab are, they're antibodies that bind and remove amyloid from the brain. Lecanumab works a little better. The side effects can be bleeding and swelling in the brain because when you remove that amyloid from the brain, it sometimes removes it from the blood vessels too. And that seems to cause bleeding in some people. Um, oh yeah, this is a little bit dated now. It may take months to roll out. Aducanumab really isn't being given anywhere right now. Um, most centers are not giving this medication because it, um, there's a lot of drama with aducanumab. Lecanumab came out a little bit later. Um, it did show ben, uh, more benefit for cognitive decline. So um, it showed a 27% slowing of cognitive decline, which is that's the headline that everyone wants to read. But when you zoom in on the data, it was less than half a point on an 18 point scale. So what does that really mean for people in their real life? You know, are they getting up and going to work again? No, you know. So does the small effect add up over many years? If you take it early enough, how long do you have to be on the medication? So there's a lot, if you go to these meetings, which I do, and you hear people talk about these medications, you can get, sit in the back and eat popcorn and hear lots of really vigorous, healthy debate about, you know, are these medications quote unquote worth it? Because this is 27% slowing of cognitive decline is a big deal. But then when you look at the, the, the scale, it's like, but half a point, you know, so they could remember face velvet church daisy red now they could remember face and velvet but are they really better you know what does it mean to be better when someone has a neurodegenerative disease so this gets really philosophical in a hurry um and they're also very expensive and they have these side effects of bleeding so you know they're these conversations are tough um, and everyone, you know, they're ha everyone is having these tough conversations all the way from Medicare all the way down to hospital administrators. Right now, um, so CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, they will only reimburse these medications if someone's in a clinical trial under what's known as the coverage with evidence development pathway, which is just kind of political speak for, yeah, they're not really covering these medications right now. Um, we do have a website, which um, we can, I'm happy to share these slides with everybody. If Lynn has a way um, to, you know, share these out or um, you can copy down this website or I can put it, someone can put it in the chat. 
um, our um, UW website tries to keep uh, track of what's happening with these medications if they're available. Um, but as of right now, they're just really not available. For, you can't just walk into your doctor tomorrow and say, hey, I'd like to get lecanemab and then you get a script and go home. They're chemo, they're IV infusions every two weeks to one month, depending on which drug. Um, they're $27,500 a year just for the meds alone. And that doesn't count the two MRIs a year you need. And so it's kind of like it's good news for research, but it's kind of disappointing news for, for patients um, because they're not really available um, outside of research studies right now. But I did kind of want to cover them because they've just been in the news so much. And if I, anyone has any experience or maybe was in a trial or maybe even knows someone getting them, there are people getting these out, you know, out of pocket, you know, Bill Gates types. You know, if you have a big checkbook, you can pay for them. Questions about the FDA meds? And you, well, we'll have time for questions at the end too. So don't feel bad if you don't ask right now, but. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about behavioral agitation and dementia. So, um, of course, this is a big topic. Um, I always say this, you know, a lot of the talks I give, you know, some of my slides, each slide could be a whole talk in and of itself. <laughs> so I'm trying to give kind of a little overview, but there are no, um, I should say there are few FDA approved meds for this. There are a couple kind of here and there. They're kind of expensive. Um, but really, um, for, particularly for Alzheimer's, there's no FDA approved meds that are clearly like, this helps this for sure. Um, and medications that we do use to help with um, agitation and behavioral issues, they do have risks and side effects. So some of the common ones you might see are quetiapine or Seroquel is another name for that. Um, you know, it can help, um, especially getting people through a, a tough spot, like they move into a new assisted living or a new adult family home and there's just so much agitation, you just have to do something. Lorazepam or Ativan um, is an anti-anxiety um, agent. You know, I give it sometimes to help people calm down so they can get an MRI or if they need to take a plane ride. Um, but in terms of using it on a regular basis, it does increase um, risks of falls, um, cognition, um, things like that. If we do use these medications, my practice is to use it for a short time and try to wean it off after a, a, a couple of weeks or a month. And then really trying to figure out what's the agitation about. You know, um, when, when we as humans get agitated, it's usually for a reason. You know, like I was hungry earlier and I was kind of agitated in my car trying to drive home because I knew I had to give a talk and I was stuck in traffic <laughs> and I was cranky. Um, so, you know, we all get agitated for different reasons. And if we can try to figure out the reasons why, um, you know, so feed the doctor so she can have some food. Um, I mean, I'm being a little, you know, silly, but um, making sure there's not unmet needs. So hunger, thirst, pain, um, constipation, urinary retention, making sure that those um, issues are addressed. Um, chronic pain can be an issue. If someone has chronic pain, they may not be able to um, speak to that. Um, so watching for signs of that or grimacing or things like that. Um, and then just being aware that, you know, agitation or being frustrated with memory loss is kind of a natural response to not having your memory. Um, and so, you know, being, you know, trying to make this uh, environment safe, you know, reassurance, gentle language, um, and really only using medications as a last resort, or if there's a lot of psychosis or hallucinations, that kind of thing. All right. Oh yeah, a good idea to remove beta amyloid. Um, yes, it does seem like that removing beta amyloid does, we have now finally shown studies that removing the beta amyloid um, is correlated with um, Re, uh, improving cognition um, in a lot of different studies. Um, oh, buspirone is an anti-anxiety medication. 
So some general principles about medications. Um, just some general changes um, to be aware of um, is that uh, medications are metabolized differently. So kidneys may be slower to clear some medication. Um, of course, if you're on more drugs, there's more possibility of a drug-drug interaction. This is just math. You know, if you're on one medication, there's no interaction. If you're on two, they might interact. If you're on three, well, now you have three drugs. So drug A could interact with drug B or drug C and so on. So you could see that if someone has a big list of medications, um, there's a possibility that some of those drugs could be interacting with each other. As we age, even if we don't have dementia, as we age, sedating medications become more potent. So um, we have to be careful with the doses. And some drugs just become more toxic at lower doses. Now, that being said, adult, older adults do often need and do well taking medications and living a better life. So don't throw out all your pills just yet. I mean, my goodness, I'm so glad that we have medications to treat diabetes and heart failure and dementia. Um, so uh, I'm glad that we have um, life-saving medications to help um, save lives and improve our quality of life. But there's some principles um, about dosing and interactions that I think just um, we have to keep in mind as we age. The Institute of Medicine got together a few years ago and said, hey, what are the top three things that we can do to keep our brain healthy as we age? Number one, reduce our cardiovascular risk factors. So treat our high blood pressure, um, treat diabetes. Number two, be physically active. I know it's so boring. <laughs> Doctors say exercise, you know, um, like that's that's not a new recommendation, right? <laughs> that goes back to probably Hippocrates written on a tablet <laughs> in a stone. Um, but it's true, there's lots of good data. And then number three, interestingly, was manage your medications. So know what drugs you're on. Bring in all your pills to your provider, what you're prescribed, over-the-counter, herbal. Don't assume they know what you're on. Because if you have a doctor at Swedish and a doctor at Virginia Mason and a doctor at UW, we have no idea what you're taking. <laughs> um, and we don't always, the systems don't always talk to each other. And then set aside a visit to ask your provider or your um, uh, pharmacist, hey, can any of my medications cause memory loss? And just have them go through those with you. Um, set aside a visit. So ask your primary care or specialty provider. Are there any medications that I or my loved one should stop or reduce the dose? Do any of these medications interact? You know, don't be afraid to ask your doc, like, hey, you know what? Can this list be simplified? This is something I see a lot. So there was a study like 100 years ago or something that statins help. They work a little tiny bit better if you take it at night. And so I have so many patients that come in and they're, they're on their statin at night, but on all their other meds in the morning and they never remember their stat because it's at night and I'll tell you how well their statin works if they forget to take it it doesn't <laughs> it only works if you swallow it into your body so I tell my patients oh just forget about that nighttime thing take it in the morning with all your other meds like you don't need to do that nighttime so now there are some meds you do need to take special like thyroid meds thyroid meds you have to take all by themselves because they're super picky and they don't want to talk to anybody and you have to have an empty stomach and blah, blah, blah. So there are some meds that are tricky, but a lot of times, nine times out of 10, you can simplify your regimen. There might be a long acting, there's a long acting metformin. I had a patient who was taking their metformin like three or four times a day and it was causing her a lot of drama. I got her on long acting metformin. It was covered by her insurance. She was so happy. And let your doctor know if your medications are too expensive. There might be a generic, there might be a cheaper option. Your doctor might not even know that that blood pressure medicine they wrote for you was too expensive and changed insurances seven times. And so just, hey, shoot them a, a message and let them know. And then your pharmacist can be super helpful as well. Um, you know, this isn't always possible. And I think it's 
totally reasonable to have a mail order pharmacy to get cheap stuff and then a local pharmacy for like your colds and flus. But when possible, try to use the same one or two pharmacies for all your meds because they can catch errors. You know, if you're going to three or four or five pharmacists, um, they're not going to know that you're on different drugs. Um, and then just be careful when your doctor changes anything. When do we stop medications? Um, so this is another, again, this could be a slide. This slide could be a whole talk all by itself. Here's some really quick truisms. It's okay to have that conversation with your doctor. Like, hey, are any of my medications needed anymore? Like, do I need all of these meds? You know, and if you stop a medicine and feel bad, you can always restart it, you know. For the Alzheimer's medications and for a lot of medications, there's not a lot of clear guidelines on when to stop, but for some there are. You don't need to take a statin over age 75 unless you have known heart disease or stroke. You don't need to take an aspirin over age 70 unless you've had heart disease or stroke. So those are two guidelines you can take to your doctor tomorrow and say, hey, I heard a talk, do I qualify for stopping these two meds? And then when do I stop Alzheimer's meds? When there's side effects, when it's clear they aren't working, when people are having trouble swallowing, I take a huge time out and I say, let's go through your meds and see if there's anything we can stop. This is an apothecary um, from Alexandria, Virginia, um, that I think Martha Washington used it once. Um, okay, so I'm gonna take a question from the chat here. Should we consult our doctor or the pharmacist first if we feel meds need to be reassessed for uh, dosing and potency? Yeah, do, the doctor or pharmacist first. That's a good question. So I think if you have kind of a quick question about dosing or potency, a pharmacist question is fine. You know, if you say, hey, I think my, uh, my medication might be too high and your pharmacist can send a message to um, your doctor and they can adjust dosing and you don't even have to be there. You know, they can message each other directly and get you on the right dose. Um, on the other hand, if you're, um, if you have, if you need a bigger conversation about, is this medicine even right for me anymore? Your pharmacist might feel a little weird giving that bigger advice because they might not have your full medical history in front of them. You know, they can speak to like small things. Um, but um, so depending on the nature of the question, um, your pharmacist can give you some, um, uh, some advice. Um, so um, let's see, does cholesterol elevated levels correlate with dementia? Yes, especially L LDL cholesterol. Um, it's not as, uh, and especially, so cholesterol, um, lowering cholesterol, um, especially your LDL cholesterol will help prevent strokes and will help prevent Alzheimer's as well. It's not as strong as high blood pressure, um, but there is some data that lowering cholesterol with statins or with other things like diet and exercise does help prevent dementia. Um, but it kind of runs out of, uh, um, effectiveness after a certain age. Um, what are your thoughts? Oh, let me answer the aspirin question, then I'll come back to the um, aspirin. Is 81 milligrams aspirin still recommended for patients over 80 with old cerebellar TIA? I feel like the benefits outweigh them. Oh, yeah. So let me just be really clear. So the aspirin recommendation. So there was a big study that came out and they said, you know what? People who have not had a stroke and who have not had heart disease do not need to be on aspirin over the age of 70. Now, if you've had a stroke or a TIA, cerebellar TIA, I think is what you said, TIA stroke, or if you've had a, um, if you have cerebral vascular disease or, or if you've had a heart attack, then that's a different set of guidelines. Um, diabetes is also a little tricky as well. Um, but if you do not, if you have your average to low risk of heart disease and stroke, and you have not had those things, um, a lot of people will say you don't need to be on an aspirin anymore. So it's one of the things you can talk to your doctor. Um, in terms of cerebellar versus cerebral at 81, I would have to defer to the literature. I'm not sure about the um, Shelly Jones. I'm not sure exactly about the um, your question. If someone has had a TIA or stroke, 
those folks, I do think they benefit from an aspirin for probably forever until, unless they have a reason that aspirin is harmful. Um, I hope that answered your question. So it's kind of a dividing line. If you've had a history of a heart attack or stroke or have really high, high, high stroke or heart attack risk, um, aspirin is still recommended. But if you have, if you have not had those things um, after the age of 70, probably being on an aspirin isn't doing anything. Um, why are doctors hesitant to start to mention medications? It's such a good question. And it's, it's such a very, um, uh, I just see a lot of variation in practice. And, and I guess it's probably comfort or if they're not getting the training. You know, dementia medications are pretty safe and well tolerated, which is one good thing about, um, about the medications. You know, they're pretty safe. And we know, you know, pretty quick if people are going to tolerate them or not. Um, so I like to try them and start them and check in in a couple weeks and say, hey, how are you doing on, on those meds? Um, <clears throat> I'm not, I'm not sure why, um, why like, re, uh, like primary care doctors are hesitant. You know, some, you know, some certainly are and some aren't. Um, I wonder if it's because they feel uncomfortable with maybe that means they're diagnosing. It's probably wrapped up in a big topic. Like there's a lot of hesitant hesitancy to diagnose dementia, to give it a label. Um, it's it's tricky. Um, oh, the trazodone and sundowning. I said I was going to come back to that. And then um, I, I will come back to that. There's just one more clarifying question about the aspirin, because this is such a really, really fun topic. So I'm going to um, dive into that one more time. Why did the guidelines change? What was the reason to stop it? I agree. I think that aspirin is helpful. Our doc recently stopped it with mom who has an old TIA and she's 92. Was it GI issues? Yeah. So the aspirin stuff is really interesting. They did a, two huge studies with people over 70 and they found that the aspirin in people with average risk, um, they didn't benefit from the, um, the aspirin and they only had um, GI bleed. So here's what scientists think. And this is all speculation because we don't know. 40 years ago, we did not have statins. We did not have as many blood pressure medicines and we smoked more. And aspirin had a lot more to do. So aspirin was helpful. Now, fast forward, you know, 30, 40 years, everyone's on a statin. We did a really good job, although still not perfect. We did a really good job getting people off cigarettes and we, um, we treated high blood pressure way better. So we have less plaques. There's less for aspirin to do. So if you're 70 years old and you've treated your high blood pressure, you've treated your cholesterol and you've stopped smoking in your sixties because your doctor told you a million times to stop, <laughs> you know, you know, aspirin is just causing you to bleed now because it just has less to do. So that's the thought. I don't know if that's true, but I kind of like it. I kind of like the theory. <laughs> so, so that's the theory. Um, whereas, like I said, before we had all those really good treatments and we smoked more, aspirin just had more to do. Um, it's not that aspirin changed, you know, but our physiology changed a little bit. Let's get into some of the questions. So trazodone and sundown. Yes. So if um, if somebody with Alzheimer's is having a lot of trouble with um, going to sleep um, and you've done all the non-pharmacologic things, like, you know, it's not the cat jumping on them. It's not the, even if it is, what are you going to do? <laughs> the cat's going to cat. Um, uh, it's not their bladder. It's not, you know, caffeine at night. You've optimized their sleep as much as possible, and they're still having a lot of sleep wake cycle and melatonin's not really helping. Um, trazodone is the sleeping pill that we do like in people with Alzheimer's because it seems to cause it's kind of quick onset and causes some of the um, less falls than something like um, Benadryl or um, Ativan. So trazodone is something that we do try a lot. Um, uh, I don't know enough about suvaroxin, uh, unfortunately. Um, it is something that I um, do see at posters and meetings, and I will definitely add it to my list of things to keep reading about and keep studying. 
Um, I'm trying to remember what the, uh, Lynn, is that available over the counter now? The reason I asked that question is because a group member sent me an article that um, uh, said that they're small studies, but they seem to think that, that there actually has been a reduction of the tau and amyloid uh, when they take that particular sleeping pill. Okay. Yeah, and I'm trying to remember, I, is, is that, I just don't remember if that's even available yet. Uh, Annals of Neurology is where the article came from. And the drug is Belsamra. Ah, okay. Yeah, I, I have very, I don't have any ex experience with it. Well, I don't want to put you on the spot. I was just yeah, curious. Yeah, I mean, you'd heard of yeah, it, 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 it's a medicine I'll have to kind of watch. You know, unfortunately, some of these brand new medications, if they just get approved, they're often really expensive. So Harborview doesn't cover them. So that I don't learn about them. <laughs> it doesn't mean they don't work, but it, it means I don't get a lot of experience with them um, because they're too expensive. Um, someone asked about Depakote and dementia related agitation. So yeah, I think, you know, if someone has um, dementia related agitation, um, what I would say is, you know, first of course, do a lot of the unmet needs, all of those things. If, um, you know, um, if somebody does end up needing medication for, um, for the agitation, I think there can be a few different ways to, to tackle that. Someone mentioned in the chat that Boosperone or Boostbar can help. So if, if it's a lot of anxiety, we will try anti-anxiety medicines like Boostbar or an SSRI like um, Zoloft you know, to try to kind of take the edge off of the anxiety and the depression. You know, if somebody has a lot of mood disorder, like um, if it seems more like manic mood, a mood stabilizer like Depakote or valproic acid might be a good, a good choice. If they're really psychotic and um, hallucinating, then you might reach for an antipsychotic. So it really kind of depends. And so it's going to really be highly individualized based on that person's symptoms. So if someone has dementia and they're really sad and crying all the time and really anxious, that's going to be, a, I think, a different kind of medication plan than someone who has um, dementia and agitation and they're kind of more uh, what we call psychotic. And I know that's not a kind of kind word um, to describe it, but what I mean by psychotic is like maybe hallucinating or thinking someone's breaking in when they're not, or thinking someone's stealing stuff from them all the time when they're not, like um, paranoid kind of thing. That might have a different um, type of medication plan than someone that's sad and crying. So you kind of really have to delve into the symptoms, I think, rather than just reach for whatever pill is around um, and target those symptoms. And then what I always try to do with my patients is, you know, try not to over promise with the meds because sometimes these, the, the, those symptoms can kind of go up and down. Um, and maybe they went down just randomly and maybe the med was part of it and maybe it wasn't. Um, and the medication, what I like to say is I think the medication can help and take the edge off but it doesn't really always cure things. And, and you know, even if it kind of helps and takes the edge off, I still like to try to get them off medications, especially if it's sedating, you know, if it's a, if it's a big dose of an antipsychotic or something, you know, I really don't want to just put them on that forever and leave them on it, you know, try to get them through that hump and then see if we can back off. Um, um, medications to avoid in Lewy body. Um, so antipsychotics are tough in Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's dementia because of their dopamine issue. So we talked about how we want to give them Cinemet so they can move. If you give them a dopamine blocker like Haldol, Haldol blocks the dopamine so you don't have the hallucinations. So you don't think the spider is crawling on you anymore but that will block your dopamine in your motor center and then you can't move and you're in a coma basically and you're rigid. So, you know, um, like you watch in those, like, like in those movies where they always have a patient 
in the psych ward and they can't move or whatever, um, that's sort of a an example of somebody um, with um, with a um, a really bad reaction to um, a dopamine blocker. Um, so, um, and if a Lewy body patient or a, a Parkinson's patient does need an antipsychotic, Seroquel is probably the safest one because it it has the least Parkinsonian um, type uh, side effect. Um, but you'd still want to use low doses. Um, and I would first not try that at all. I would try denepazil first because denepazil can help. So that's why it gets um, it gets important for it's pretty important to really get into the symptoms. Um, which I know, like someone already mentioned, that it's always um, it's hard for primary care docs because they're balancing so many different things. Um, all of the um, uh, websites, so the Alzheimer's Association the Lewy Body Association, and then the Frontotemporal Dementia Society. So they all have their own little websites. They have really good websites about these things and recommended meds and things. So if you do, if you are having problems with, um, with this, you can always take those websites to your doctors as well and say, hey, you know, I've been reading about this. And according to the Lewy Body website, this is a medication that might help my loved one. What do you think? And at least it's not like, I read on the internet, it's, oh, I read on this very specific Lily Body website and it's, they're really short and um, those can be really helpful too. Um, all right, I think um, these were just my fun little slides. Um, I, oh yeah, I put some slides about diet because I study diet. <laughs> so, um, supplements, yeah, no food, one food or supplement will cure disease. Um, you know, this is kind of like the exercise recommendation. Um, a nice, healthy, balanced diet is the best studied for brain health. So the summary of just everything we talked about, there are some medications with, which might be harmful for brain health, um, but good news is there's almost always alternatives for those medications. I think the Alzheimer's meds are actually pretty safe. They do have evidence of benefit, but it's okay to stop if they're not helping. Be mindful of dosing of medications and know your meds and use your pharmacist for information, um, especially if your doctors are so busy, it's hard to get in to see them. Um, I hope that is helpful. Um, and we can take, I, I don't know exactly when this, how long we have, but I can talk about this all day because it's my, one of my favorite topics. <laughs> Um, so we have we have uh, room for for questions until eight, but we don't have to be that long. Um, gotcha. Did did put a a question related to the frontal temporal dementia? Uh, anything? Any specific recommendations related to some of the behavioral issues that uh, families run into? We find that to be one of the most difficult types of dementia for the care partners to deal with because of behaviors. Yes. So um, I put in the chat there. Um, so just like the Alzheimer's Association has its own little website, there's uh, theaftd.org. I'm pretty sure that's the website. Um, and um, they have a really nice set of uh recommendations for different behaviors and things like what you can do. Um, um, in terms of medications, unfortunately, there hasn't been a lot studied. Um, and um, the uh, um, the best studied medication for um, uh, uh, frontotemporal dementia is um, the SSRIs or the antidepressants, so things like Zoloft or citalopram. And then the Alzheimer's meds really don't help. So um, I know every now and then people get put on them. And I, I mean, I don't think it would be like harmful, like it doesn't harm the brain or anything, but they've just been shown not to help um, the kind of, uh, memory loss that they have because they don't have choline, uh, deficits. Um, it's a, just, it's a different kind of disorder. Um, I mean, so, um, 
So if, if you find that they're on those medication, medications, you can wean them off. Um, and then, um, oh, let's see. VAFTD.org. I suppose I, I could double check that that's the website. It's... Um, I can uh, check that. Yeah, so... Um, the question about um, interactions, I think you'll, um, the interaction um, uh, is, is a really good question. Um, supplements can interact. Um, I don't know that much about supplements for interacting with memantine. Um, I, um, I mean, a lot of people are on a lot of these supplements and it's so hard to study because people are on so many. And choline, I mean, people are on choline boosters and memantine and they work synergistically. So I don't know why choline itself would hurt, you know, memantine. So each individual, so it's hard to study them individually. Um, but there are, um, pharmacists can help you look up specific supplements, especially if you're using, using them in high doses. I think if you're just on like a multivitamin that has a little of this and a little of that, and it would be hard to argue that they're harmful, um, because they're trying to mimic eating a couple vegetables, right? So <laughs> it would be hard to argue that they would be that helpful. But if you're taking mega doses of supplements, I think it's always worth having those mega doses, uh, have your pharmacist run those through a, um, a drug drug interactor with your medications and make sure. Um, and, and it's usually if if you're on a mega dose of something, it's usually going to affect the absorption or the metabolism. Um, not so much the pharmacology, um, because honestly, a lot of those mega doses of supplements, you know, they don't change your pharmacology all that much. It's more about the absorption and the um, revving up your liver metabolism. How do you find out what type of dementia a person has? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> um, it's, it's an MRI is a part of that. Um, it's, it's a complicated, um, exam. So it's mostly the history and it's the, um, uh, exam. So his, it's a combination of history exam and some type, type of testing, often MRI or CT. Um, so, um, it's, it's not necessarily one thing. Um, it's kind of like assessing someone's heart failure too. You need their history, you need their symptoms, you need to get a picture of their heart. It's not just one thing, it's the whole picture. Um, and in theory, a primary care doctor can make that diagnosis, um, but if it gets complicated, often the primary care doctor will want to refer to a specialist, especially if it's not straightforward. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a good question. And maybe I can come back to you next, come back to you all next year and talk about diagnosis because I think that was, we were thinking about a topic similar to that. Um, so can you predict extra pyramidal effects of antipsychotics? Not necessarily. Um, I mean, if you have Lewy body or um, Parkinson's disease dementia, you're more likely to have those, but anybody could get them. Um, and I guess one thing to be aware of is if you're on higher doses, you might get them more. But, but no, I mean, it, it's hard to know who's going to get what. They're a little bit. Oh, yeah. So um, antipsychotic. So like the tremors, the. Um, oh, let's. I'm trying to think of uh, like the lip smacking. Um, some of the symptoms like that. Um, Let's see if I can think of some other ones that are common here. Uh, the most common, so repetitive and fallen involuntary facial movements, such as tongue twisting, chewing motions, lip smacking, grimacing, um, jerky limb movements that can also happen. So kind of like, um, I don't know if you've ever watched like my, Michael J. Fox, um, he has Parkinson's disease. Um, and when he's on Cinemet at certain doses, he might have um, extrapyramidal effects from his uh, from his medication. 
um, where he kind of moves his arm without thinking, but he can move at least. Um, so um, when you have Parkinson's disease or Lewy body dementia, and you're trying to treat these both movement and psychosis with dopamine and blocking dopamine, it can get really complicated. So um, just an advocacy for checking in with neurology or a doctor to, to really finely titrate those medications. And if you're worried about side effects, they really need to, um, um, you know, titrate them down for sure. So I have another question for you going back to the new drugs. Yes. First of all, in your practice, what do you see as actual result if you have seen any or have you seen any since maybe they're not using them where you are? Yeah, I, I'm not a part of those research studies. Um, so, I mean, it's all, it's all just reading what the studies are showing. Do you have um, a sense of how early diagnosis would need to be made for them to potentially be effective? Yeah, I think that's the million dollar question that everybody has right now. Um, nobody really knows the answer to that question. Um, it's tough. It's tough because, you know, if you treat someone that just has very early disease and amyloid, you're going to have to treat them for years to see an effect. And, you know, nobody wants to do a study for years and years on end because these diseases are so slow. So is there anything that you think is promising? Yes, there's absolutely a lot of promising drugs and different medications and different um, therapies in clinical trials right now. Absolutely. So I, like I mentioned at the very beginning, um, I'm a part of a couple of clinical trials where we're looking at repurposing diabetes drugs um, that seem to show some promise for treating Alzheimer's. Um, there are people looking at oral forms of these um, amyloid therapies. Um, so they're, they're earlier in their stage, but if we could get rid of amyloid, but in an oral fashion, so you didn't have to be on an infusion and it wasn't so expensive, that might take away some of the cost, um, you know. So um, that might be, that would be huge as well. You know, it's one thing to put someone on kind of a risky medication. You know, you might take that risk if you have a disease, but it's another thing to ask you to pay 28000 for it, <laughs> right? I mean, the cost alone is just prohibitive for Medicare, for people, for Harborview, for it, a lot of folks. So the oral forms of the amyloid therapies are being studied as well. Um, and there's just a whole bunch of other different types of medications being tried for metabolic, um, for um, just also tau. Someone mentioned tau, so tau therapies, um, all kinds of things. Um, one last um, question. Well, um, I'm going to take one last question, and I think I need to go just because I have a, kind of an early morning tomorrow. I need to get some start. Um, so do, oh, that's the supplement question I answered already. So it, it's a quick, quick one. It's about yeah. deprescribing. Yes. If you would just quickly address the importance of deprescribing as people okay. get older. Was there a question there or was that just? More, more of a, um, we talk about it a lot. You know, what meds are, are people on and do they need to be on them? And are, is somebody addressing them? Those kind of things. Oh, yeah. So I think that's kind of my, you know, bullet point here at the bottom here is just know your meds and set aside a visit to talk with your provider about medications. So, you know, I, you know, deprescribing, I mean, do you need to be off of a med? You know, there's not necessarily a rule like you need to be off of two meds tomorrow, you know, like everybody's, it's going to be very highly individualized. I mean, you might go to your doctor to say, hey, I would like to talk to you about deprescribing. And they might go through your whole med list and everything and check your blood pressure. And it turns out, actually, you need to be on one more medication. Sorry, your blood pressure is not at the goal, <laughs> right? I mean, uh, um, so that might actually, um, so deprescribing um, is a, um, is a concept of, you know, 
if you're on an inappropriate medication, that should be, be prescribed. But that assumes you're on an inappropriate medication. But some people are not on the appropriate medication. So, because blood pressure is still not well controlled in this country. So, um, I don't know if this is answering your question, um, but um, I think if you follow these kind of points about know what meds you're on, set aside a visit to talk with your provider about medications, and then, you know, particularly if you're worried about memory, saying like, are any of these medications causing memory loss and can I stop or reduce the doses? I think that'll be a good place to start, you know. Um, at, you know, obviously if somebody has diabetes or a complex disease like rheumatoid arthritis or something, I mean, things are just going to be different for each person because they just might be on complicated meds that, you know, you can't just stop or whatever, or they don't want to stop because they're helping. Um, but um, I think just giving you the power or empowering you to say, hey, it's okay to talk with your doc about, like, I want to stop my meds if I don't need them. I just think that's huge. And I try to give my patients and families that permission. Like when I start a medicine, I say, if you want to stop this at any time, please let me know. You don't have to be on this forever. You know, um, I think that that's a, a big part of it. Um, Cause I think you're right. People get put on these medications forever and they, um, uh, you know, nobody, ever thinks to stop them they're just on them forever yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. um and that's thank not you so good. much so I yeah well thank you just working all day long and then doing this for us <laughs> yeah. is huge so yeah well thank you so much everyone for having me and like i said um lynn i'll send you these slides um and then yeah feel free to distribute especially the websites and things like that might be helpful and um absolutely we'll you know how to out. get a hold of me so uh, sure. i'll be around <laughs> thanks a lot all right thanks everyone good luck with your research all right yeah thanks yeah bye-bye all right